G'day and welcome to Choosing Your Uni. I'm Rob Malicki coming to you from Garrigal Land here in Sydney, Australia. My guest today is Ben Bryan from Charles Sturt University. Super good to have you here, Ben. And mate, your story is a little bit different to my students because you're studying fully online. Tell me about that. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me. So I guess for me, I'm coming from Wiradjuri land um, here, Dubbo, Western New South Wales. Um, and for me, I guess in terms of um, where I'm at now, in terms of study, the NCP, like New Colombo Plan Scholarship and distance education, I actually uh, was working full time and I decided to study tertiary education. So I thought I'd never go to uni, finished, you know, high school, thought, you know, I'm just going to work labour work, trade work, hospitality, whatever. And I actually come to working full time. I was working at a pub, so in a bar and restaurant in here in Dubbo. And I was also working part time initially for New South Wales Health and so the Western New South Wales Local Health District. So I got into working as a person, like a lived experience worker, peer worker. So yep. essentially, I've got a lived experience of mental illness, lived experience of drug and alcohol recovery. Yep. And why I decided to study distance was I didn't want to give up a job that I loved so much that I was mm -hmm. fortunate to have without a degree, which was really, really, and it's quite rewarding. It's the job I actually do now full time as well. So That's distance okay. education, yeah. And so you, what was that moment like? Like, do you remember the moment where you're like, you know what, I reckon now's the time to jump into a degree? Yeah, look, I think I owe a lot of credit uh, and merit to like my hiring manager, peers and colleagues around and family as well. But particularly it was just something inside of myself where I just said, you know, I build up confidence in myself as like a professional or as in sort of that in professional world, just in the, in the employment industry. I just thought, look, I need to move vertically rather than laterally so i was doing a lot of bits and pieces you know i was working hospitality had other things but i was like i really want to you know progress and build a career for myself and i really like this mental health industry but in terms of getting to where i need to be and getting a foundational understanding of things i decided that i wanted to do uni and it was do i go part-time full-time do i study and i looked at charles sturt and i'd spoken to quite a few people out here in regional rural new south wales that study with charles sturt university where one of the, if not sorry, the latest stats released, we have the highest postgraduate employment outcomes for a rural and regional new university. And to go into, I suppose, why I said I want to be a mental health nurse was one thing that I want to do social work, do therapy, counselling, et cetera, or do I want to do psychology? And I think I talked to every manager, nurse, person that I, <laughs> I knew for about three months until everyone said social work is the most universal degree, social okay. justice and is a part of society itself. And I decided to go online for social work and it's been fantastic. It helps me. Every subject I do as I go along is developing me and my work even more. And I don't haven't even done a prac yet, so it's all been self-paced oh, wow. online. Yeah. Wow. Hey, mate, there's so much I'd like to unpack out of this. Maybe I'd like to start just by asking about like what advice you'd give to a young person that's hesitating about whether or not they want to go to uni right now. What advice would you give to someone in that situation? Look, I think the best thing to do and the easiest thing to do is immediately reach out to a university. So there's plenty of university out there. I'll always shout and scream about how good Charles Sturt University is for yep. all the universities, particularly one that's in rural and regional New South Wales. So a lot of the country lads, young country people particularly don't think they do it or we're still, I suppose, not less progressive, but we still predominantly have a lot of agricultural and trade life. Still lots of people here, for example, that'll do degrees, nurses, doctors, etc. but just reaching out. So I literally just went through student services, sent the email, the websites and phone calls, the way you can get onto a university is so accessible these days. You can literally say, hey, I'm just interested in uni and you'll get so much information, phone calls, meetings, everything, course guides, there's orientation days. For me, I literally just reached out to the uni, set up a time to talk about it and I asked every question on the sun before I decided because that's what they they have whole teams that are dedicated to student services and prospective students. So just do it. That's the only advice would be. And what's the, what's the fear of it is you do it, you do it for a semester, you finish the subject, or you don't, you don't enjoy it. You're not locked in for a four-year degree for the rest of, you know, however long it is. You don't have to pay that up front. There's hex options. Like it's honestly, it's just worth giving it a go and set your aspirations high. You will do this degree. You'll barrel it over. It's self-paced yeah. as well when you're online. I do some semesters, I'll do three subjects. Some I'll do one depending on my personal circumstances. So what's that? Let's go into that. What's it like studying online? So you can do, obviously choose the number of subjects you're going to take. But like the mechanics of it, how's it work? So generally, I would say for someone that's online, you'd work more closely and intensively with student support services generally within your, so you'll have a, a school and a faculty. So, you know, you have for medicine, social, um, police, criminal justice, et cetera, you know, different clusters. So for me, 
my faculty is arts and education and then under that I'm in the school of social work and arts so generally you'll have like a subject coordinator or a course director and they'll have a team that will liaise with you about it so for me early on I was like wow I'm online what do I do how do I pick subjects how do I put them into this big intimidating admin system <laughs> essentially I just reached out and they gave me um, like a bit of correspondence and a list that said here's your, you know, your 56 units or whatever. These are the ones that you should do in order. And I actually said, can I tailor it to the amount of subjects I want to do per semester? And they said, sure. And I said, look, I don't want to do four. I don't want to do two. I want to be difficult and do three. Yeah, sure, Ben, that's no dramas. They write me up what's called an enrollment pattern. Yep. Step by step, run me through how to put the subjects in. I put the subjects in, explain how to do it the next time. Fantastic. Circumstances change in terms of the mechanics, like you said, Rob. I ring them up or email them again. And they say, look, Ben, you want to do two. This one, one, you want to do one over Christmas? Like unusual summer subject, here's a customised enrolment pattern, follow this. Beautiful. Yeah. What I love about the idea is that you can start off doing something, but it's not interrupting the rest of your life. I mean, in your case, you know, you didn't want to give up the job. That yep. makes sense. So it's almost like, you know, there's so much pressure on young people, I find, that, oh, my God, I need to pick this this path. But here, actually, you're, you're like splitting the best of both worlds. It's like you're playing the work game, you know, developing your skills, getting ahead in that space whilst also, you know, experiencing the uni stuff and exploring different areas within that. Because obviously social work, allied health, all of that's a huge discipline where you can then specialise or subspecialise as you, as you go through. But you're not under this pressure to just like make one massive decision. You can be a bit more flexible. That's exactly right. And I don't have sort of an actual occupation. So people actually sort of look at me a bit funny when I say I'm not doing social work to be a social worker or an allied health yeah. practitioner, which is a bit different. So I'm in my sort of field and in my community when i say community i don't mean geographically i mean my community as people with mental health conditions right. people with disabilities i'm doing social work to progress to positions where i can invoke change in systems so that's a sort of the bigger picture idea but i want to get into i'm in a leadership position now as a team leader of a, a small non-clinical mental health service and without a degree through hard work determination and utilizing my lived experience so for me social work is a way of understanding more doing more and being able to progress not so much just in terms of a hierarchy but unfortunately a lot of things that we need to do are governed by degrees and for me having a degree is also a massive achievement as a person that as of five years ago barely even thought of the idea of leaving the house for example really yep T tell me more man tell me about tell me about your experience there Happy to share. So I'm an open book. So my job role, obviously, as in as in currently what I do, you know, Monday to Friday is a peer worker. So a peer worker, in a nutshell, is a person with a lived experience, particularly in this circumstance of the mental health condition. So I've lived with depression and anxiety, yeah. amongst other things, since I was 15. So that's say almost 15 years. And I actually use that regularly. So it was a criteria for my job role. I had to, you know, talk about my experience. And just moments ago, earlier in the day, I've taken some time here at work to actually do this talk with you but i've just shared some of my experience being a person that's lived with depression and drug and alcohol challenges that was one of my motivations actually to get into university not to i suppose prove it to myself like that you have to do this degree otherwise you haven't succeeded but for me as a person five years ago i was probably in the interest of being you know humble but still very truthful i was probably one of the smartest people i find in a lot of my classes throughout my secondary school but I just give, didn't give a crap about any of it. I was too interested in, unfortunately, substance use and wagon school and those things to now being in leadership positions for the government, being in various you know, advisory committees and state positions, other things. And I like to think that experiential learning is the most important thing for people. And I would advocate that for universities as well, that the experiential learning meaning, for those who wouldn't understand it, actually learning by doing is yeah. the important part. So just to add, I suppose, to being a distance student, I decided one day what I didn't have enough to do with the uni just on a sort of extracurricular way. And I said, Dubbo campus is fantastic, but I feel like I'm just not in touch with it. It's one of the unis that has less of an on-campus presence. So I signed up to be a student mentor online. So online, nice. I, I do student mentoring, student ambassador. I did one of the open days here at Dubbo. And even as a distance student and a full-time worker, I'm a student ambassador and student mentor to bring myself as part of the uni, you know, be a part of the actual uni community. What... um. What kind of turned things around for you? I mean, you're saying you're like, you know, enjoying a bit, a bit too much of the good life and think things are a bit loose back in the early days. But so, yep. so what turns it around for you? Yeah, look, I think I'm not going to say everyone has a right to it and everyone should do it or could do it, mm -hmm. but it's just we all have our own different paths and they're the fork mm -hmm. in the road. And unfortunately, I went down a really dark path and had a lot of challenges and a lot of struggles and was in a really bad way of life. And I guess for me, just wouldn't say it's you hit rock bottom and you, you bounce back up from there. But for me, I just knew I needed to make change and I was mm -hmm. fortunate that I had you know, some, some really supportive friends. I did a bit of soul searching actually in terms of I travelled away, not 
in a gap year as such. If I were to talk years later in living too much of the good life, like you said, Rob, I decided I'm going to go away and I actually travelled and spent time with mates, I did a bit of soul searching. And what I found was I just always knew that I was a caring person. I was a very empathetic person and the term of an empath, I was very attached to other people's emotions and I felt like I always wanted to help people. And yeah, when I came back, I did a couple of different jobs and I tried TAFE, I actually got ironically happy to say it's suspended and kicked out of TAFE for just acting inappropriately to now in the community services assert that I was enrolled and I'm happy to tell the story. I was just still unfortunately damaged from substance use and mental health conditions that I just stuffed up royally in class and carried on and was inappropriate. And to now moving forward, I suppose the progression I study online, leadership position in community services. I actually am employed casually as a trainer for an organisation as well, doing my cert for TAE. So it's a bit of a, a flip, but there's not a pivotal moment, Rod, it's just, uh, Rob. Sorry, it's just, yeah, I, I just knew something had to change and I'd really just knuckled down and just said this is too much you know I've lived the good life to the amount of probably three people like many young people will and I said why don't I go and work why don't I go do uni isn't that fascinating mate like I just love this idea that the tide will always change at some point yep. and it, it just depends if we're going to go in and out with the tide you know you can stand on the beach and watch it go out and you know that's just a moment of change that can that, that, that you can embrace yeah, we can always we can always change. But that I find is one of the most beautiful things in life. As long as you've got a choice, you know, as long as there is a choice in front of you, yeah, between path A and path B. And unfortunately for for some people, that there's literally no, there is no choice. But for most of us, there is. So yeah. there's, there's always something to to kind of latch onto there. And I guess I mean the other thing is being out in rural Australia. I mean, a lot of people who probably watch this either from overseas or from the from the big cities probably yeah. don't don't understand what it's like to be out in country Australia where yep. there's fewer support services and things like that. So I suppose that came with its own challenges too. Yeah, yeah, no, look, it really does. I mean, I'm from Dubbo, so Dubbo in the later years, you know, five, ten years has become a lot bigger. It's yep. regional versus rural, but it still has a lot of the st stigma around mental health, lack of services. But, you know, I grew up earlier for a number of years. I'm living on a farm outside of Dubbo on a property, so I've lived sort of that lifestyle as well. I uh, live with family, friends, etc. But it is, it's very different. Like I've spent time in Sydney doing training, you know, Newcastle, Coastal, seeing friends. So I've spent a bit of time there, but I still blow it when I go there. You know, every second block has a mental health service, an NGO, a counsellor, anything like a, a grocer, a store in Dubbo, you know, it's, you know, you have your main drag, your main area, your mall, and a, a lot of services. It's a great, fantastic hospital and health service here in Dubbo. We're really well established. But for people, for example, that are out, you know, in Walgut, um, for, as far out as Broken Hill or people out in Coonabarabin and stuff, there's not services there. And even in university, you know, in terms of if you want to study on campus, if you're anywhere in Western New South Wales, really, it's only Charles Sturt University. And I shouldn't say only because it's a fantastic university, but that's the university people pick. And yeah, I think being where I am and living where I am at smaller towns people know your stuff in sydney you know you, you're living the good life or you're in a you know a really challenging moment of your life dealing with you know an episode of mental health no one knows it you're in such a large place here in dubbo with you know say fifty thousand people or something there's still a chance 10 to 100 people know your business yeah, unfortunately right. yeah a bit of a left turn but but staying with the kind of regional theme because i'm a, one thing that, that's always perplexed me about university in australia is the fact that so few Australians will move away from home, even think about moving away from home for uni, whereas, you know, our universities are full of students that have come from the other side of the world. Yeah. Um, and we have incredible universities out in the regions. So th there are people that are currently studying in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane who would actually be better suited at like Charles Sturt Bathurst or Charles Sturt Wagga Wagga in one of these sort of places. So what... Tell me a little bit about the life out in regional Australia, just so if somebody like that is watching this, is thinking about Charles Sturt, they have a bit of sense of what it's like to live out, out in the regions. Look, it's fantastic. I would, I know as a young person, I think you get a lot of young people do say, oh, you know, this place is crap, there's nothing to do. You could say that in, in New York City, for example, or Sydney, where there's everything to do, everything to do on each corner. But there is, there's plenty of things to do, and it's a fantastic place. I've met plenty of friends, family, colleagues, clinicians in the health service, for example, that have moved here for job prospects, family, you know, um, it's, a, it's a fantastic place to live, have a family, progress in terms of a job career, definitely. You know, there is plenty of things there. And I think if you were to think about job prospects, we have one of the best newest cancer centres and oncology treatment um, services now at our um, cancer centre at the Dubbo Base Hospital. I think it's like rated one of the best in the Southern Hemisphere. Don't quote exactly that, but I know it is 
you know, quite a high standard. You know, we have the school, University of Sydney, I believe, has, you can learn medicine now in Dubbo, uh, through Dubbo and Orange. We have a great CSU, like Charles Sturt University Dental Clinic. I recently went and got some teeth done by uh, some students, some final year dental students. So I'm a big, obviously, supporter of universities and that, but it is fantastic. I think financial cost of living in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane is just exponential. You move here, it, I mean, it's still probably costly, but it's going to be a lot. And Charles Sturt University campuses such as, you know, Bathurst uh, and Wagga are really, really high quality universities. Absolutely unreal. And the job prospects are really good. Like we have the highest graduate outcome. So yeah, I just, I just saw that number number one in Australia for like the sixth year in a row. Yeah, yeah cracking along. And I, I know there's sort of other sort of intersections of stats, you know, best of this, best of that. And I'm not to gloat about it. I'm quite proud and I've grown to be more proud of it as a university. But I think that just represents not just Charles Sturt, but regional New South Wales part of me in my lived experience my job role is the community it's always a good sense of community like i did mention before it has its troubles as a young person experiencing mental health but obviously during times of you know a good life a good stage of life in terms of a career development study it's fantastic like yeah absolutely unreal yeah i I think that's so true i recently spent a couple of years traveling around 18 months traveling all around australia and it just blew me away how many opportunities are available in this country outside of the big cities and nothing wrong with the big cities like fantastic places too but i I think young australians should really think about what all of their options are not just the one that's down the street and but and international students too you know if you want a real australian experience getting out to a charles sturt uni charles darwin university up in darwin or some of the regional queensland universities just offer something so different and particularly i i personally find that the people who want that more community experience you know, they want to be part of a class where the teachers know their names, you know, and where they're closer with their other classmates and community and, and the like. Yeah, small, smaller regional institutions definitely have so much to offer. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I spent some time just like, this is just say, going to visit a friend when he was at Newcastle. So he's from Dubbo, from Warren, actually, which is way more rural that. remote. Yeah, so way more out there. And he moved um, to Dubbo and actually moved to Newcastle and attended the uni up there and I spent some time like just visiting up there and I thought this is amazing like the campus life was amazing you know there's not that it matters but there's bars restaurants post offices football fields everything on campus like just like one of our regional universities and I thought this is crazy but um, on the same thing I reckon if you were to go in a regional uh, rural university like Charles Sturt you'd know most of the people there's a lot more community whereas if you go to the big city for example there's a lot more people which is great there's a lot more facilities but in terms of that real sense of community and actually learning for people like you said rob when you, your teacher or lecturer actually knows your name on a first name basis which i think is important but yeah like there's there's opportunities everywhere i think country people are obviously quick to all right you pat you finished um year 12 you know you're 18 having a gap year or not okay pack up and troop off to armadale troop off to uts you know somewhere uni of queensland you know one of those sorts of things whereas it could often be the other way you don't hear very often someone mm-hmm. in Surrey Hill saying, all right, time to pack up and go down to Charles Sturt in Wagga or something, whereas that could be a fantastic thing. 100%. Yeah, I completely agree. So you're doing a Bachelor of Social Work. What are you enjoying most? Like, subject-wise, what are you enjoying most? Look, what I probably thought I wouldn't like, which is ironic. I mean, I'll be really transparent. There's some things in social work that bore me, but there I know that I know they're the things I should know and need to know. But for me, I like to... How can explain this without sort of going on a tangent? I like learning about why I think about things. So not so much in terms of psychology, but in terms of the social science part of it. So, mm-hmm. for example, we affect society um, while society affects us. We are also dictated by, for example, the historical time period that we live in. Um, for example, um, if I see a person that looks a bit scruffy or a little bit dishevelled on the street, we're quick to judge and say that person's likely used drugs and alcohol. That person might be homeless. But Unpacking that and understanding why society has wired me to think like that is understanding my parents, for example, the environmental factors. I was handed down that stigma as such. Mm. For example, that society is so quick to judge people and think about the drug and alcohol use, we immediately associate someone that looks not to a, a high standard of mm. formal wear or attire, which again is a social construct, that we're so quick to associate them to all these issues. So that person's homeless because they they don't have clothes. They're not wearing shoes. They might not want to wear shoes. So I just think learning about that and also I think a little bit some more. I do enjoy psychology subjects in a sense. So I did health psychology and um, child and ad- child and adolescent development psychology, which is quite intersectional with social work. So learning about, quite simply, 
how your childhood, your environment, your atmosphere that you're around and your family construct shapes you as a person moving on into adulthood, the different stages. So that's a little bit more clinical. It doesn't sort of mesh with my job role as such, but I just find it's really helpful information. I think I do sometimes analyse myself and think of, you know, am I this way because of X, Y, Z? But yeah, just learning about that's been really, really important. And my actual one of my most favourite, if not favourite subject was, I wish I could knew the exact course name, course code. It's First Nations Contemporary Aboriginal Histories oh, wow. and Realities. It's, it's wow. quite a long, comprehensive title, but it was really, really good. And it was just understanding, I suppose, the impacts of colonisation, how First Nations people are, how society um, interacts with that. And it was really, really important, I think, to learn about. And I actually found each and every part of that was not a tiny bit boring. So I thought, yeah, that was fantastic. It's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, yeah, a little digression. I'm really heartened to see so much progress happening at least awareness around First Nations people and issues. You know, there's a lot of progress that is still still required, but it's it's heartening to see little things, you know, little things happening, little bits of symbolism and things that bit by bit add up to more meaningful steps. So that subject was called, it's IKC 101, I remember the code. It's called Indigenous Australian Cultures, Histories and Contemporary Realities and unpacking that. So we Amazing. learned about the history, the reality of it, but we also understood what policies and current practices and social. So, for example, it's not, learning about how a first nations person lives but it's understanding why there's a lot of the challenges and barriers and if we're going to be you know these really great human services workers social workers we need to be able to work with people of different diverse communities particularly first nations because we live and work on first nations land so yeah fascinating recently as i mentioned in the intro like i'm on my garrigal land and yep. i was like you know what i i want to go learn some gari some local language yeah and it's it, it's not an easy process it's not no. just just something that there's a centre down the road here. I literally live right next to Gadigal National Park. It's the national yeah, park named after the first first huge national park here in Northern Sydney, named after the First Nations folk. And there is not a place where I can just go and learn language, which is now a mission. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna chase it down because to, to me, like that's you know the language is so important, language and culture so important for us to really connect with with those stories and that history. Ben Bryan studies Bachelor of Social Work at Charles Sturt University and is off on the new Colombo plan to the Republic of Korea in just a few months. going to have an amazing experience. Mate, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your story. Um, and you know what? I'm super looking forward to reconnecting in like a couple of years' time when you get back from this. Awesome. And have a good yarn well. about, about what it was like. Yeah, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the time. Good on you, man. Thanks.